Luke chapter 13, verses 18 through 27. And once again, we're in a part of the Gospels where Jesus is doing a lot of teaching. So we're very fortunate. Get to hear the words of Christ, the wonderful teachings of the Lord Jesus. Well, first I'm going to read those verses. Luke chapter 13, verses 18 through 27. Then said he, Unto what is the kingdom of God like? And whereunto shall I resemble it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his garden. And it grew and waxed a great tree. And the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. And again he said, Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? It's like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door... And you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he will answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and you have taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. You are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Well, Jesus starts out in verse 18. He asks a question. He has two questions, actually. Unto what is the kingdom of God like, and whereunto shall I resemble it? What's the kingdom of God like? So Jesus looked at the world around him, the natural world, the plants, the trees. And he said, I'm going to tell you what the kingdom of God's like. It's like a grain of mustard seed. And he's talked about a mustard seed before in his teachings. He said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you'll be able to say to a mountain, remove hints and the mountain will be, would remove. Very a small amount of faith. A mustard seed is very, very small seed, I'm told. It's tiny. You can almost can't see it with the naked eye. It's really tiny. So he's comparing the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, he says here, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, it's like a grain of mustard seed, but it's planted in the earth. It's planted in the earth. And then it grows and it grows and it grows and it becomes a great bush. So it's like a tree. It's so big, it's like a tree that the birds can come and sit in the branches. So what's he talking about in the kingdom of God? Well, I think for one thing, he's talking about his perspective of the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is made up of everyone who gets saved and becomes a member of the kingdom. More and more people, as time goes by, get saved. And so the kingdom of God, in that sense, grows. It grows. Starts with a little seed and it grows. What's the seed? The seed is the Word of God, you could say. You could say the seed is Jesus. Remember in the first promise of the Messiah, where God said to the woman, Your seed will crush the head of the serpent. So the descendant it meant. And Jesus was small in the earth. He came from, he lived in the remote region of Galilee and Israel. The little town of Nazareth, which had a bad reputation that nothing good would come out of Nazareth. And uh, Jesus started the church, didn't he? He's the first one to use the word church. He said to, Pe to Peter, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus is the rock. And Jesus is the building of it. One reason that Jesus doesn't come back now... He could come back today, but one reason is he wants the kingdom of God to grow. He wants more people to be saved. That's where you and I come in. He wants to use us to help people. 
to come to be saved. That's why he said, So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He wants the kingdom of God to become larger. In other words, more people to be saved. That's what God's after. Notice what he says in verse 20. Whereunto shall I like the kingdom of God? In verse 19, he talked about what a man did. A man planted a seed and it grew. Now he's going to talk about what a woman does. A woman bakes bread. She takes leaven and puts it in three measures of meal. My grandmother was a cook who used a lot of natural cooking. And she made bread. I can remember as a child seeing a piece of flat dough laying out there. And the next day, it wasn't a piece of flat dough anymore. It was a big loaf of a loaf. What happened? Exactly what Jesus said. I didn't see it moving and growing, but the next time I looked at it, it was much bigger than, than it was. That was leaven. That's yeast. And uh, imperceptibly, you might say, there's something in there. And it starts growing and growing. It gets bigger and bigger. It's kind of like the kingdom of God. We don't see it. People don't even talk about it. Most people in the world, they don't know the kingdom of God's growing right in front of them. Every time a heart turns to Christ, the kingdom of God just grew. And no one sees that. We can't see what's going on in the heart. God works in the heart. We can see the outward appearance. God sees the heart and he works in the heart. Someone comes along in life and they start growing, a child. God starts working in their heart. I think he works in the hearts of children especially. Jesus said, except you become as a child and become converted, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. Children more easily accept Christ because their hearts are still more innocent, more tender, not as hard yet to the gospel, to the truth, to the calling of the Holy Spirit. So imperceptibly right now, God is working in the world. He's working in hearts all over the world to bring people to Christ. How shall they believe except they hear? They might be prepared to believe, but they need to hear. That's God's method. They need to hear the gospel. They need to hear a good Bible verse like John 3.16 or Romans 10.13 or Revelation 3.20. One of those great Bible verses that tell people how to get saved. And then when they hear it, wow, I, I'd like to be saved. But they have to hear the gospel before they can... Awaken. But imperceptibly, that's happening all over the world. You can read the news media. They'll talk about the cargo ships backed up. They'll talk about the COVID and how many cases there are in this country and that country. They'll talk about our government and how messed up it is and how many bad decisions they're making. But how many talk about, wow, the kingdom of God's growing today. That's what was Jesus was thinking about. He was thinking about the kingdom of God's growing. People don't know it, but I know it because I can see people's hearts and I know it's growing. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying to Jerusalem. What did Jesus do? People say, well, he, he performed miracles. Yeah, he did that. He, he was a teacher, though. That was the main thing. He was a teacher of the truth of God. That's what I'm going to say when I go to France. I say, I'm an American. I came to France to talk about God. And that's going to be my introduction to people. And I'm going to see how they react. Hopefully they're going to listen to what I have to say. That's what Jesus did. But he was journeying towards Jerusalem. What's the big deal there? He was going to die in Jerusalem. And that's what it's saying. He knew what he was doing. He was on a trip. Where did Jesus' road end in life? Death. It ended with his death. Unless Jesus comes back soon, we're all going to die. We're headed also to our end point. I, I think about that more and more. I want to do more for the Lord then. If I'm going to die in 15 or 20 years, I want to do something more than I've done up to this point. I want to do more for the Lord, if the Lord will let me. He went to die, but that must have been difficult. He knew how he was going to die, when he was going to die, and he still traveled there. If I knew, well, you're going to die, if you keep going this way, you're going to die on this day at this hour. Okay, well, I think I'll go this way then. That's what I would do. No, not Jesus. Because he knew he was going to go, die for the sins of the world. And he had to die so that we could go to heaven. Then said one to him, oh, they're going to ask him a question. Maybe they understood a little bit his teaching. That he's thinking about the kingdom of God and how big it would be and how many people would get in there. And somebody says to him, Lord, are there few that be saved? 
Are there few that be saved or many? All the millions of people in the world, are a lot of people going to end up in heaven or just a few? And guess what? The answer is not a lot, only a few. He said that before. But he says it this way in verse 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Many will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Well, there's the answer. Not many get saved. Many will not be saved. They'll not be able to enter the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is saying. The reason he's saying it is to warn people. He uses two words about it. First, he says, strive. That means make that your great desire to get into the kingdom of God. That's the most important thing for any human being to get into heaven. We're going to live on the earth for a few short years. We're going to live somewhere else forever. So the most important thing for me and for everyone else in the world is that they get saved so they go to heaven. That is the most important thing for every child, for every adult, for every person on this earth. So he said, strive to enter in. Make sure that's what you really want. You got to desire it or you won't seek it. And then he called it the straight gate. That means narrow. It's a narrow road to heaven. It's a broad road to destruction. Many go down the easy road, the broad road. Very few find that narrow road because it's only Jesus. Remember Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to heaven but by me. No one. That's why it's narrow. It's only Jesus. They'll strive to enter in. When will they strive to enter? Why don't they strive now? Oh, they're going to strive to enter in when it's too late. They'll desire to enter in, but it'll be too late. And that's the answer that the decision is made in this life. Every person decides in this life if they're going to go to heaven or not. And that decision is made by what they're going to do with the claims of Christ. When once the master of the house is risen up, oh, he's talking about himself, and has shut the door... And you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Now there's the key phrase. I know you not. You got to know Jesus as your personal Savior. True Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with Jesus. Do you know Jesus or not? You meet Jesus when you bow before him and you call upon his name to believe in him and to ask for his forgiveness of sins. Then shall you begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in your presence and you have taught in our streets. So Jesus is speaking even to the people there in the first century. He says, a bunch of you people, you see me, Jesus Christ. You're looking at me and you're hearing my words. One day, if you don't get saved, you're going to say, well, we were with you, Jesus. We saw you. Let us into heaven. And guess what he's going to say? Guess what he's going to say? But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. If you don't know Jesus... You're a worker of iniquity. He that gathers not with me scatters abroad, Jesus said. We can only do God's work if we have the Spirit of God in us and the Spirit of God guides us and uses us. Anything that we try to do out of our own effort, human effort, human will, is not even serving God. Those that don't know Jesus will be considered evil because we all have sins. Their sins will still be on them. That's the wonderful thing about getting saved. Just think about it. Heaven's a place of holiness and perfection. No sin can enter in there. No sinner can in enter in there. So God takes sinners like you and me, and through faith in Jesus, He declares that we're holy and we're righteous and we're just, even though we're not. He just says we are. And whatever God says is true. That's why we get to go to heaven. We have the righteousness of Christ 
credited to our account. Those that don't believe in Jesus do not have the righteousness of God credited to their account. So they have their own sins credited to their account. They won't be allowed into heaven because they don't know Jesus. Notice what he says in verse 28, Jesus says, to warn people, to tell them how terrible that moment will be. Can you imagine? Someone lived on the earth, maybe they were a little bit religious, maybe they went to their religious services, maybe they read the Bible a little, and, but they don't get into heaven because they don't know Jesus. And notice what he says, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What a terrible moment that will be. The moment when people stand before Jesus and they realize they missed their chance, they cannot go to heaven. They will cry and weep and wail because they know now their destiny is secured. When they rejected Jesus when they were on the earth, when they did not repent of their sins when they were on the earth, when they said, no, God, I don't want you. I want the pleasures of sin for a season while they were on the earth. Then the, the day will come. The day will come. And right now they get to, you know, they have the free will. They go, oh, I'm not interested. I'm an atheist. I don't care what you have to say. Don't bother me with that. Now they're tough guys, right? They got that hard heart, the hard words. Oh, but no. Not when they wake up and they're told they cannot go into heaven. They will weep and they will wail. They will cry and the tears will flow, but it'll be too late. It'll be too late because they rejected Christ. When they had their chance, when they had the chance to make a decision, their decision was a permanent decision. They chose to not know Jesus as their Savior, to not know him inside their heart. And therefore, they will weep and wail. And when you shall see, notice what Jesus says to these Jewish people, mainly he's talking to Jewish people here. When you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. And he said, well, you're going to see, you know, the great fathers of the Jewish religion, of the Jewish people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets, the great people of the Old Testament, Moses, and Jeremiah, and Isaiah, and Samuel. You're going to see them in the kingdom of God, but you won't be able to join them. You think they're, you're the descendants of them? Well, no, because you don't believe like they believed. You don't have a relationship with God like they had. And behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. That's God's great principle. People on earth have these hierarchies of who's important, who's good, who's uh, popular, who's a celebrity. So human beings have this list of who's who, right? Who's who in the world? Oh, but God has a different list. He sees the humble person who's a true believer. No one knows about them. Mary was like that, really. That's why she was chosen to be the mother of Jesus. No one knew but God what Mary was like. And so he chose her. And that will be true of many others that are poor, cast out, unknown, despised, persecuted, hated. And God will take those that are last on the earth and he'll make them first in the kingdom of heaven. On the earth they're last. He will make them first because he knows their heart. Verse 31 says, The same day there came certain of the Pharisees, saying unto him, Get thee out, and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. So they thought they were going to scare Jesus. They had all kinds of ways of trying to oppose Jesus. This particular time, they thought, Hey, you're going to die if you stay here. The king wants to kill you, and so you better run, Jesus. You better get out while you got time, because he's going to kill you. And so Jesus said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. So he's three days away from dying on the cross. And uh, so who's in charge here? Jesus is. Herod's not in charge, even though he's the king. Remember, Jesus said, Don't fear him who can kill the body. Fear him who can kill body and soul. But Jesus is in charge. He decides what happens. He will decide when he dies and how he dies. Herod won't decide it. God himself will decide. And that's the same 
thing for each of us if you think about it. We're here for a certain amount of time. When am I going to die? When God decides. My life is in His hands, so is yours. So make the best of the time you've got. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Many prophets were killed in Jerusalem. It's supposed to be the greatest city on earth. That's what it was designed to be. The city of David. The great holy city where the temple was. Where God brought his teachings initially. The word of God was given there in Jerusalem. Largely. The Old Testament especially was given to the Jewish religion. They were supposed to take the truth from God and teach the rest of the world. Oh, Jerusalem was supposed to be a wonderful city. It became a city of war, a city of murder, a city where the best people would be killed when they entered into it. And Jesus was going there to die. He knew he would be killed in Jerusalem, the holy city. And so verse 34 is the great statement that Jesus made about Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen does gather her brood under her wings, and you would not. Compassion. He's weeping over the city of Jerusalem. It's the way God made human beings. God gave human beings a choice. God wants everyone to be saved. He persuades people. He invites people. He died for all the, the whole world. He cries for people. He raises us up, Christians, hoping we'll be good witnesses, so we'll help people come to Christ. And yet, He gives to human beings a free choice, a free will. Why is it that people will go to hell? Why? Sometimes people ask that question. How can a loving God send people to hell? God doesn't send anyone to hell in reality. They send themselves there. You would not. All they had to do was make a decision. Remember he said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. It's how God made the, the world. He gave every human being a free choice. You can make your choices. Make sure you do like Jesus and surrender your choices to God. When he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Jerusalem would be destroyed because they rejected Christ. Forty years after this event, forty years after Jesus died, the Roman army could take the Jewish people no more. They've had enough of their rebellion, of their uh, attempts to be in independent from the Roman government. And uh, they destroyed Jerusalem. The Roman army absolutely leveled that town. They destroyed the temple. This temple's still not there. Why not? Because of what Jesus said here. The Roman army destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. It's still broken down. Still not rebuilt. And because Jesus, he warned them. He warned them. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And it's their fault. Because of their choices. And verily I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time come when you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. I think he's talking about the second coming. One of the reasons for the great tribulation, because guess who's going to suffer greatly in the great tribulation? The nation of Israel. Jesus is going to time He's going to have the timing for his return. It'll be just right for the people of Israel to save them. Remember, the great army of the Antichrist will be in the valley of Megiddo, coming to Jerusalem to take it over, to kill the Jewish people. And Jesus will come back to say, and then they'll be ready. After they suffer through seven years of great tribulation, and after all that hatred comes against them through the Antichrist and the armies of the Antichrist, they'll finally be ready to accept Jesus at the second coming. Then they'll say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. What did they say three days after this? They said, Crucify him. Crucify him. They rejected Christ. That doesn't end well. One of the reasons for all the troubles in our country, I believe, is because of 
the amount of rejection of God. I was recently, this, yesterday I was reading in the book of Second Chronicles, the great king Josiah became king. And uh, when he became king, evidently the word of God had been set aside. Somebody in the temple found the Bible, the law, the first five books of the Bible. They found it and they brought it to the king. And he started reading it and, and, and he realized how sinful the people had been. They had not been obeying the word of God. They'd not been serving God. They'd set everything aside. And he wept. And he repented. And he was sorrowful that they were so sinful. And they had gone so long where they had set the Bible aside. Because you can't serve God without the Word of God. Jesus made that clear, right? He said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of, from the mouth of God. We got to have the Word of God. It's our spiritual food. The Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God brings us back to Jesus. It brings us back. If we put it down, then we're going to just keep going our own way, further and further away from the Lord. But the Word of God each day brings us back to think about Him, to believe in Him, and to know what He wants us to do. Well, anyway, Josiah, as the king, he had the Word read to all the people, all the people of the land. Think what he did. He made sure the Word of God was spread, was read, was known, was studied again. And think what our leaders did. 1960 or thereabouts, when the judges of the Supreme Court said, you can't have the Bible and prayer in school. No, that's religion and uh, th those teachers are government workers and therefore they're, they're spreading religion and, and we're supposed to have separation of church and state. By the way, the word separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. And uh, all it means anyway, that phrase means that the state should not establish, a, enforce a religion. It doesn't mean that government workers can't quote the Bible or say things that are true and good according to what they know. Our country went for, what, a hundred and so many years, almost 200 years, where the Bible was opened up in classrooms and taught whenever teachers wanted to. No restrictions on that. And that was good to do that, by the way. What's going to happen to a country that was founded on Christian principles? And it was. If you know what happened with the Mayflower, all the different things of the founding fathers. It was founded on Christian principles. Our country was established because people wanted to get away from oppression in Europe. They wanted a free country where everyone could worship as they wished where people have freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Is there freedom of speech now in this land? Oh, no. You pay a heavy price in many, many environments if you say whatever you want to say. Used to be in America when I was a kid, well, we have freedom of speech. They may, I may not agree with them, but they have a right to say that. That used to be what was said. Not anymore. Now you're a, you're a terrorist or you're anti-government or something really negative about you. If you say certain things, they're considered not politically correct. The importance of the Word of God. But there's a penalty for those that go away from God. You can't go away from God and benefit. If you're close to the Lord and you go away from Him, that's worse than never having been close to Him. To whom much is given is much required. So it's, it's a sad day. But for Christians, we know that's going to happen. The time shall wax worse and worse. There shall be a falling away first. What that means is, though, we still serve the Lord. The ones who can still serve the Lord are taking up their responsibility and their opportunity. Instead of dying out, that's what I look for. Where's the zeal to serve Jesus? That's where the Lord is. Don't die out just because the other people are. So anyway, when they took the Bible and prayer out of our schools, they constantly taught for generations now, since 1960-something, I was in fifth grade. They constantly taught 
that there's something wrong with the Bible. Basically, that's a message. There's something wrong with the Bible and prayer. And so that entered into businesses. That entered into the public square. That entered into the politicians and the judges, that concept. There's something wrong with Bible and prayer. And now people think there's something wrong with church. No, Jesus established the church. Find a good Bible teaching church or establish one yourself. That's God's work. God's will. Well, let's stop at this point. I think it's a good place to stop. It reminds us of the second coming of the Lord, the events that are going on. Jesus died for our sins, the first century. He rose from the dead, which means he's still alive. That's why you can know him personally. By the way, remember, that's what you're supposed to do to get to heaven. We, he said it twice. If you know him, you'll get to heaven. How can you know Jesus? He died. Oh, he rose from the dead. He's still alive. So you can know him. He, and he promised, I'm with you always to the believers. I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. So we don't have anything to fear. Just like Jesus had an appointed day when he would die, he knew his appointed day. We don't. We have an appointed day when we're going to die. Well, let's live for the Lord until then. Nothing can harm us till then. I can get in an airplane and fly to France and talk about the gospel in France. I can do things here in this community. COVID's not going to kill me. Whether I'm vac vaccinated or not, if God wants me to stay alive. He has a day. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. So, knowing that we're going to die should have two effects. If you're not saved, they say, wow, I need to get saved because I'm going to die, and I'm going to go either to heaven or hell. I want to go to heaven, so I'm going to go to Jesus and get saved. That's what that should mean. If you are saved, then, wow, I may not have much time left. I've got to serve the Lord now while I can. I want to be used of Him. I want to bear fruit for Him. I want to do His will, not my own will. So I better pray about that. I better seriously seek to become the person God wants me to be and to walk in fellowship with Him. By the way, the reason you can walk in fellowship with Him is that He forgives us every day of our many sins. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the secret. Stay humble. You're a sinner, but Jesus forgives you every day. Yeah, you've got a home in heaven, but while you're on the earth, your feet get dirty as you walk through the earth. You're still going to sin. Make sure you believe in forgiveness from Jesus. He'll forgive you every day. He'll give you His grace every day. And therefore, you can keep serving Him and following Him. Not because of how good you are. He'll give you another chance. He's a God of second chances and third chances. And He'll keep wanting to use you because you're still on the earth. If He's done with you, you wouldn't be here. And that's what, When He's done with us, that's when we leave the earth. So, serve the Lord while you can. That's what Paul said, even when he was close to death. Forgetting the things that are behind, looking forward to those that are before. What's before us? A world of lost souls. What can I do to help reach them? Well, draw close to Jesus and he'll use you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for the Bible and all the things you taught us. Thank you for salvation, that we get to go to heaven freely through you. Thank you that we can live the life that you have for us. We pray that we could live more like you, Lord, and do the things that you want each of us to do. We thank you for the food we're going to have today. We thank you that it's symbolic of your body and blood that, that you gave so that we could be forgiven. We pray for those that don't know you, that you would touch their hearts and that you'd use Christians so that many would come to be saved before it's too late. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.